we are recording. Um, let's talk a little bit about schedule here. We're almost almost time here. We're going to talk today about any questions you have from the practice. Focus on that. Um, we might do a little bit of final exam review. I feel like the camera is like at a weird angle today. Uh, oh, but then there's my green screen. I feel like something moved though. Anyway, um, so we can work on the practice and we can also do some final exam review if you like. You have one last homework and quiz, which will be due um, homework due tonight and quiz on Friday. And then uh, Monday we'll do some review in class for the final, which is really just unit four, exam four, chapters 10 through 13. Lots of hypothesis testing. A couple of confidence interval questions in there too. So um, yeah, that is the plan. Any questions about what you should be working on, about what's due, uh, what you, what's coming up here? All right, let me know if you do have any. Excuse me, I have, I have nothing prepared for today. Because we did all of the examples we had prepared for Monday, all the extra practice. So I have two ideas. One, um, I would love to go over any questions you have from the practice from chapters 12 and 13. So we can, we can take all class on that if you want. Um, and then two, if you would like, we can also start preparing for the exam. There is an extra practice. It's in D2L and I can show you what that's for. Uh, that's a good tool that we can do as well. So I'll just kind of open it up to you and do, maybe we can see if anyone has any questions from the practice first. All right, Brittany's got us started. Question about number three. All right, we're looking at a new drug, wondering if it affects, if it has an effect on the patient's heart rate. We got 105 patients. 50 were randomly assigned to get the drug. They were treated and 55 were not treated. The results are below. Um, some of them, their heart rate uh, increased. The other ones, these, there was no heart rate increase. And so we're wondering, is, is there evidence whether these two are independent? Um, there's comments here about the expected counts for the, the chi-square test for independence. You want to make sure your expected counts are at least five for, um, um, well, let's say no more than 20% or less than five. Uh, if we do our expected, we can see here they will all be more than they will all be more than that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just copy and paste this. I think there is some sample data in StatCrunch. I put that up here. I can't remember if it's there but it should be easy enough to copy and paste this, but it's gonna, we're gonna have to edit it a little bit. And in fact, I'm just gonna copy and paste the data only, not the totals. So I'm gonna copy the data only, not the totals. All right. Um, I need to get a blank stack crunch window. Now, if you have this data, this is like summary data. If you have it, you're good. But I'm going to just click. I think I want to click in the title and then hit paste. Yeah, so then I have, you could just type these. There's not that many cells. But the key is I want to have the labels in one column. And these are, these are the categories. And I'll just call it labels, whatever. So it's either they're treated or not treated. And then I have um, whether the heart rate increased or there was no heart rate increase and the counts, but no totals here, no totals. That'll mess up your test. That was not really clear here, was it? Because I just said copy and paste the data. And like, oh, I'll copy and paste the whole thing. But you just want the counts. You just want the counts. All right, so we're gonna do stat tables contingency with summary. The heart rate are gonna be our two columns. And then the treated or not treated column is the row labels. Let's try this process now. So stat, tables, contingency. Now we don't have data, we have a summary with summary. Right, we don't have, we don't have rows for all the 100, whatever, 105 patients, whatever that it was. We don't have 105 rows. It looks like we have data, but we really have a summary, a summary table. The columns are heart rate increase, no heart rate increase, and the row labels, or I call them labels. 
And then we want to do expected count. So we're going to click expected count and we want to do a chi-squared test for independence. There's a bunch of other stuff here. I don't even know what some of this stuff is. So there are more hypothesis tests. Look at some of these crazy names. McNamara's test for marginal homogeneity. I know what homogeneity means. It's like they're all the same. Uh, mm -hmm. There's another test for independence. I don't, I have no idea what the man, mental Heinzel is. So statistics is like, we are just like tip of the iceberg. It feels like we're doing a lot, but we are just, just dabbling in, in that. And then look at this, confidence intervals. What, what even are these things? <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff there. I've, I recognize some of these. Um, the Kendall's Tau, I recognize. I don't remember what, what context it was. So all we're gonna do is we're gonna get the expected counts because we wanna make sure they're all at least five or no more than 20% of them are less than five. And then we want the, this is the only one we're gonna do here is this chi-squared test for independence. And you'll see under each one, it shows the expected counts. And they're all at least five, so we're good there. So we can do the test. And then we have a p-value, relatively small. So let's do, let's see here. <coughs> so the all the expected, if we're gonna answer this question here, I'll maybe type this in red. At least five, so the conditions are met. All right, and then we do our steps, right? Do a null hypothesis is that, um, what is it, the drug and the heart rate increase are independent. Always the null hypothesis is independence. And then the alternative is they are dependent there's a relationship. We aren't given an alpha again. We just said, I don't, I don't, are we? Do we have evidence that whether the patient received the drug and whether his or her heart rate increased? Isn't there, aren't we missing a verb there? Are independent? Do we have evidence that whether the patient received the drug and whether his or her heart rate increased yeah, we need a verb there, R independent. <laughs> okay, so we aren't given an alpha. We could, you know, this is an interesting point. Um, usually we choose 0.05, uh, but we don't have to. You could choose 0.1, and then that would affect, like that. that's important and that's relevant. That changes your decision in this particular case. And if you're doing a drug and there are risks to the drug, um, there are consequences for that. So you can do a different alpha if you like, if you're going to deviate from 0.05, you should really have a good reason why. Um, and this uh, our test statistic was a chi-square, and it was 3.42. The value was 0 0.06 something, 0 0.0645. All right. So what do we think based on what we've set up so far? You wanna do your vote, uh, yes or no? Click on participants and click yes or no. Do we reject no hypothesis? Awesome, awesome, awesome. I see all red, great. So we do not reject, it's close, right? This is my point, like if you had picked a different alpha, but then you'd have to know like, well, why would I pick point one? You have to have that set before you do the test. So you can't, you can't choose alpha after you know the p-value. <laughs> like then you're choosing an alpha that you get to decide yes or no. So your alpha has to be based on, it's like a, an experimental design thing. It's kind of above and beyond what we've done. This would be the person who is designing the drug and testing the drug okay, what would happen if I made a type one error? What would happen if I said there was a relationship, but there really wasn't? So I rejected the no, but I, there really, I shouldn't have. What would happen? Do I wanna make that error? What are the consequences for that error? 
that would determine your alpha because the alpha is that probability of a type one error. So in this case, we just kind of went with the standard. We do not reject the null. If this was me and I was a researcher, I'd be like, man, I'm gonna go and do another 100 patients and so then I'll have 200 patients and let me see what the results are then. Maybe you go for 500. Um, this, this type of study would not, with 105 people, would not get a drug on the market. It would just be like a preliminary study to get more funding. And so maybe you're like, you know, it's close enough. Maybe let's do another small study. Um, see if we can get, because they need thousands of patients, thousands of tens of thousands before they can go sell this to people on the market. All right, do not reject the null hypothesis. And I kind of already said the conclusion, right? Um, there is some, but not enough. To say that the, uh, there, is a relationship between taking the drug and uh, an increased heart rate. You could just, you, this is a little, I'm being a little fancy there. There's just not enough. That would be safer. There's not enough evidence. There's not enough evidence to say that there is a relationship. That's safer. Um, and then if, if you're doing this on the exam, I would really encourage you to just control all copy and paste that here. Um, we actually don't need some of this stuff. That's just junk. But leave the table. You know, this is your work, right? This is how you show your work. The space. I hate how Word does all this spacing. There. So you can say, hey, here's my work, here's the table I made, and here's the, here's the results of the test. So Brittany, are we good on that one? Yeah, my, I realized as soon as I looked at it, I'm like, oh, I remember last semester, students typing in the 66, and I can remember being in class, not last semester, last spring. I can remember being in class and people having this typed in and I had to go on the board like, oh, shoot, I didn't really give good instructions there. And I still, I haven't fixed the file. All right, so, all right, moving on. Rachel is asking about number one. This one, let's see, this one is the enrollment first digit. This is a weird data file. What I did is I took the, the enrollment files uh, from the 2015, 2016 Illinois school data. And I just pulled off the first digit, which is kind of weird. Um, oops. So somewhere in here, it should be enrollment first digit. Okay. So it's just one digit. And it's one through one through nine, right, for the enrollment. Um, and it's kind of this weird question, like, well, it seems like that should be random, right? It should be random. So we're going to test that. Does it seem like it's actually random? So let's take a look here. Oh, and I just realized something, Brittany. I think you asked about this one via email. I think I might have given you a little bit of bad information. You might have already caught me, but I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So we're gonna do stat, summary stats table frequency, and just get a frequency. That's all we want, just frequency table. Just how many of are each digit? So it looks pretty random from one, two, three, and four, but then you get less and less and less like sevens, eights, and nines. Uh, and if you think about enrollment at a school, those would have to be like 90 or 900 or 9,000. Those are actually not very likely. Elementary schools are like two to 500. Middle schools, you know, maybe 500 to 1,000 or something. And then high schools can vary uh, significantly. But it's kind of interesting. So it just on the surface looks like it's not, looks like it's not actually random, but we're gonna do, we're gonna be more rigorous. So the question is, are the chi's, are the conditions met to perform a chi-squared goodness of fit? And if so, perform that test at the 5% level of significance. So the observed is that frequency column. Uh, if they were random, oh, I forgot to store in the data table. I'm sorry. Shoot. Because I want it, I want it in StackRunch. Uh, store in data. There. Okay. 
because I need I need it actually in stack crunch to, to analyze. I suppose I could copy and paste. So the conditions, let me look those up. Uh, you're going to want a good formula sheet for this. So what I would do for if, if I were you, I would have all a list of all of the hypothesis tests and all of their conditions and then some more details under each one. How do you know when to use it? Are there some key words that you know it's a proportion or a goodness of fit? Um, so I would, I would have some really clear information about that. So let's scroll down, goodness of fit test. All the expected frequencies are greater than or equal to one. No more than 20% of the expected frequencies are less than five. Well, we have some really big numbers here. I, would, I wouldn't be worried about that. But let's go ahead, look, look at how big our actual numbers are. So let me do this. We're gonna do, let's take a look at that goodness of fit test. Chi-squared test, yep, chi-squared test. All right, so we have two options here. We talked, I feel like we talked about this last time. Um, you have your, what do I want, frequency. So those are my actual observed counts or frequency. And then I can either get actual expected counts, which I could do here, or I could say all the cells are in equal proportion. If I wanted to get the actual counts, and I don't have them here, but if I wanted to get actual expected counts, I would have to get the total number here. Uh, where did that go? I wanna get that result back up here what was the total 37 35 so there's 37 35 total um there are actually i think i told you in email Brittany, 10 but there's actually only there's no zero first digit so there's nine possible first digits so 37 35 was the total we would expect to get 37 35 divided by nine so we would expect to get 415 for each one. That's what we would expect. So I can type in the 415 here if I wanted for each one of these. But to be clear, if you're expected is that they're all the same, just check that box. So there's no need to do this. Um, there's no need to compute all of these because that's just one of the options. All the cells uh, in equal proportion. But you'll see here all our expected values are very high. They're all at least one. And they're all, at, and they're definitely not more than 20% of them less than five. So we meet the conditions. So we're going to do frequency. We're going to check all the cells in equal proportion, and we're going to display the expected. And you'll see it computed the expected just like I did. And not surprisingly here, we got a really high chi-square and a very small p-value. Very small, very small. So are the conditions met? Okay, yes. Is there evidence that are actually random? Is there an equal number in each category used a goodness of fit test? Okay, so A, yes, all conditions were met. The expected counts were 415 for each. So definitely meet those conditions. Um, if so, perform the test. Okay, so um, yeah, what do I do here? I'm trying to like, I'm trying to get a new. Eh, ah. We're gonna restart at one. I don't want to screw up the other numbers. Okay, I think the other numbers are okay. I don't, I'm not going to save this file anyway. This is all messed up. All the numbering is all messed up. Okay, no hypothesis. Um, this would be just in words, like um, the first digits are random. Yeah, that's, that's what we're testing. The first digits are random. And then the alternative is the first digits are not random. So the null hypothesis is always that they fit the distribution. So it's a goodness of fit. How well do the data fit the distribution? In this case, the distribution is boring. Same, 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 same. Um, so, and then the alternative, the first digits are not random. In other words, the counts do not fit the distribution. 
So you're not, it's called a goodness, it's interesting, it's called a goodness of fit test. <clears throat> you're not actually testing to see if it fits. Excuse me. I should be muting, I'm sorry, that was probably pretty loud. You're not actually testing to see if it fits. You're testing to see if there's evidence that it doesn't fit. Right? That's the way this hypothesis test works. Okay, so there's that. Were we given an alpha here? 0.05, we were given it this time. A statistic, it was a chi-square. It was really big, wasn't it? 1,000 something? Uh, where did that go? Uh, 1,132, we'll call it. 1,132. And then p-value was very small. It was less than 0 0.0001. I think you've done enough of these where I believe you that you can reject an hypothesis. You know that. Um, why don't you take 30 seconds? Uh, if you haven't done it yet, type it out for yourself. Uh, if you have done it, just kind of hold on for a second. And let's see if we can get the wording correct here. All right. I see Brittany and Justin. There is enough, Brittany said there is enough evidence at the 5% level of significance to support the claim that the first digits are not random. And uh, Justin said the same thing. He just didn't specify the level of significance. So that's, that's totally fine. I just copied and pasted here. Here's what Brittany wrote. There is enough evidence. Um, and this language is really good. Uh, I would not deduct that. Um, it really should be there though, but it's, I wouldn't deduct that if you, if you left it out to support the claim. And then you'll notice that both Brittany and Justin put in what the claim was, that the first digits are not random. So it looks like the first digits are in fact not random, which makes sense. I wonder if we did the last digits, that would be interesting. I bet the last digits would be more likely to be random um, you know, because what's the difference between having 436 kids and 432 kids? Like, it's a two and a six. It doesn't seem like there would be any pattern, whereas the first digits, I bet, are not random. Okay. Oh, now I got all my numbering. No. This is supposed to be two, number two. Okay. Um, Rachel, how are we on this one? Does that, do you feel more comfortable with that now? Okay, excellent. All right, any other requests from the practice? Hmm, Daniel's saying when doing the ANOVA test, what's the point of checking that, testing the homogeneity of variance box? So if you look at the ANOVA test, we're getting a little like we're, we're getting pretty abstract here once we get all the way to this ANOVA test. Um, so if you'll see here, this, these are the requirements to perform a one-way ANOVA test. Uh, they have to be simple random samples. They must be independent of each other. All the populations must be normally distributed. And then this last one, the populations must have the same variance. So within that ANOVA test is another box you can check of whether the variances are the same. The, the difficulty with this, and this is one of the things that I remember hating about statistics when I was you, is there's a lot of fuzziness here. By that, what I mean is the ANOVA test is actually relatively robust so that if the population variances aren't all the same identically, but they're pretty close, then the test results can still be reasonably valid. If you were writing a paper, you might say, 
oh, we did this test for the homogeneity of variance. Homogene homogeneous, remember that means all the same. So it, are the variances all the same? So if you were writing a paper, if that failed, you might write in a paper, well, the variances weren't the same, but if we look at these distributions, they all look like the same histogram. So the variances are relatively close. Um, so, you know, and if you get a p-value of 0 0.049, well, hey, your variances weren't the same. Your p-value is very suspect. But if you get a super low p-value and your variances were pretty close, then the test is probably going to be okay and you can kind of still be confident in your results. So we're checking that box to see if the conditions are met. Um, but I think if I remember correctly, we kind of wave our, I feel like there's an example in here where we kind of, it's not exactly met, but we kind of say, well, it's close enough. I'm trying to remember here. It might be different. I might do that in my face-to-face -face class, but not, but not in this format. Yeah, here it is, here it is. So if we look at number seven, we're looking at health behaviors in school-aged children, we're looking at weight grouped by res residence area. And we're trying to see, um, does where you live have an effect? Is that related to your, your the mean weight of that group? So let me show you what this would look like. And kind of getting back to your question, Daniel, of the point of checking that box. <clears throat> okay, we're doing ANOVA one way. Where values are actually in a single column here because it's all weight. And then our factor is where they live, right? Residence area. Okay, and then we're going to check this box to test the homogeneity of variance. Um, okay, I think that's it. All right, compute. And if we go down here, ooh, this one, let's see here. Let me go back to that instructions. Ooh, it looks like we're actually okay on that one. Oh, it's the normally distributed. That's not quite right. Uh, that's right. So here's what this test is saying. I'm, I'm going up the directions for the test are under number six. The populations must have equal variances. So we check that box. The null hypothesis for this particular test is that the variances are equal. And you're looking for evidences that they're evidence that they're not equal. And so you can see for that test, it looks like the variances could be equal. We did not reject that null hypothesis. Um, you can kind of see this backed up if you do a histogram of weight, or maybe let's do, let's do box plot and we can see them all together. Uh, box plot of weight uh, group by residence area and we're going to not do outliers and draw horizontally and if you look here do you see how they're all pretty much spread the same they all seem to be spread out pretty similarly the unclassified seems to be a little bit wider but that's what this test is for it says well it might be a little bit wider the variance might be a little bit more right variance is about spread variance and standard deviation so it might be a little bit more spread out, but they pretty much have all the same spread. And so that condition is met. That's one of the requirements to, that's the fourth requirement in order to be able to do the ANOVA. So this one, the students were all selected randomly. They're all independent of each other. Um, the populations must be normally distributed. So you'd have to check that. Um, and this is the one I think is not exactly met for number seven. Uh, and then they have to have equal variances. That one is okay. That one is okay. So the reason why, Daniel, that was a long answer, but the reason why is this number four point right here, that it's one of the conditions required to do the ANOVA analysis. Does that help? Does that answer your question? Okay. 
Good. Yeah, we're doing we're doing some really high level stuff here, which is why I'm kind of giving a lot more information in the practice files because like you're just first. This is your first statistics class ever. Like these are suddenly a lot of details to remember. Like how are you supposed to remember all these? So that's why I'm putting more information there. Um, I probably wouldn't put this much on the test because you will have your notes. So you should put this stuff on your notes so you know what the conditions are. Um, and I feel like, yeah, let me, um, let me, I'll get to your question in a second, Brittany. I feel like for last week, and I think this week too, we always, I, won't, I always want you to be checking these conditions. And I'm trying to remember, I think we had at least one example where the conditions weren't met, if I remember correctly. So <clears throat> that could happen on the test too. What I'm likely to do, to more likely to do on the test, however, is maybe give you three different example tests and just say, are the conditions met? Don't actually do the tests. Just, hey, here's three different tests. Can you do the, is it a NOVA test or comparing two means or a proportion test or something like that? And so just checking those conditions. It's a lot for you, like it's weird to have a 12 point problem or 10 point problem, which I think they're, cause they take a long time. So, you know, we'll have maybe a 10 point problem to do this hypothesis test, have maybe eight of them, cause that's the majority of this test. So we have eight of them, but one of them is you do the checks, oh, the conditions aren't met and then you don't do the rest and what if you were wrong like it just doesn't seem like a good way to do a like an exam so so if i ask you to do the test you can assume the conditions will be met so Brittany is asking on number seven this one that i started to do about the um comparing the equality the homogeneity of the variances but there is that other condition that the variable must be normally distributed so if we check that graph histogram and we do uh, weight and group by residence area and what i'm going to do here is i am going to um there's weight on at the bottom i'm going to give them make them use the same x and y axis then they'll all they'll all look similar and then I'm also going to make it a relative frequency. So what we're looking for is each of these should be approximately normally distributed. And you can see here, the what I, like I think I did all this work to do the example and then I was like, oh, well, um, what, what do you think I noticed? Anybody see any concerns we might have here if each of these are supposed to be normally distributed? Nobody sees anything? If it's normally distributed, what should this look like? Right, Daniel, should be a bell curve. We could even overlay the normal, right? Overlay the normal distribution. Uh, and you can see what shape are they really? If you had to describe these, what do these look like? Yeah, Rachel, you're right. And Justin, yep, it's, they're definitely right skewed. You know, they're not like income, like super, super right skewed, but I mean, they're pretty clearly all right skewed. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, okay, they're definitely not perfectly normally distributed, but the weights are sufficiently close to normally distributed for our analysis. So this is kind of what I was getting at earlier, and this is super high level and not something I'm going to ask you to think about on the test but just to be clear um, if I was doing this as a researcher I might still publish the results 
but I would just put that caveat like, okay, our, our variances are, are fine because we did that test, the p-value is high, so we can assume the variances are almost you know, close to equal. But these are not normally distributed, but they're still like relatively symmetric, and so some deviation from normality will be okay in an ANOVA test, but it's not great. So I would kind of include that in my analysis. And that's just, I don't know, that seems very fuzzy and likely not very satisfying to you, but that's kind of the nature of a lot of statistical analysis. Your data doesn't, is not perfect. So, um, so that's why I put this here, because to Brittany's point, if you looked at that, you're like, well, um, those, don't, those don't look good. Those histograms don't look good. If we do QQ plots, which is what Brittany said, that's how you can check for normality, right? If you do QQ plots, of weight grouped by um, residence area. These should all be linear. And you can see, ooh, that doesn't look good. That doesn't look good. That doesn't, like they're all skewed. So none of these look, I mean, they're pretty close so in the middle, but then they deviate at the ends. So none of these look great. So I think it would be great to have that inclination to say, ooh, it doesn't look like they're normally distributed. Um, my problem is, I spend this, like I, I do this course trying to use real data, and it's actually harder than it sounds to find a variable like this where from different populations and they're all normally distributed. It's harder than it sounds. So I think if we had done height, but that would be a weird test. Like why would you, why would heights vary? I think we did that in class, but it's like, well, that's kind of a weird, why would we care about height? Let's see how those look. Oh, see? Those look better. Uh, the reason why it's the weird stepping thing is because the heights are all uh, inches. And so they, they jump up. But it, you see how much closer it follows the lines for height? Uh, and if we do a box plot, um, where'd that go? Results, box plot, and do height for that one. Oh, not box plot, I'm sorry. This histogram is what I wanted. The box plots do look more symmetric though. Histogram and do height for that one. Uh, they'll look much better. A little skewed left, pretty symmetric, symmetric, pretty symmetric. So the heights look better. It just, I was trying to get like a real authentic question like, does weight vary by where you live? That seems like an interesting question. Urban people versus uh, rural. Suburban, like, I don't know, I, I, I would think maybe the weights would vary by where you live. I don't know. Um, so that's why I did weights, but then the problem with weights is they're not normally, they're not normally distributed. So, so yeah, it was kind of interesting. So that's why that language was there. And so Brittany, to your point, the answer to your question is yes. I do want it be good to, to comment on that. Uh, are the conditions met? And so to comment on that, like, you know what? The QQ plots don't look linear. And then say, well, based on the note here, I will go ahead and, and do that test. Okay, good questions here today. I hope that I hope that some of these tests, like you, I imagine it feels a little overwhelming, but I hope you're like getting really good at knowing how to make a conclusion. Because like now you have this idea of this what a hypothesis test is. I have a null hypothesis. I have an alternative. If I get a low p-value, I think my alternative is true. That's a really powerful thing because I could throw out some other new tests for you. And all you have to know is what is the null? What's the alternative? Here's a p-value. Oh, okay. Well, that's a low p-value. So that means I think my alternative is true. And that's a really cool thing. Like you could read actual articles, published research articles now and kind of look, oh, low p-value, oh, what was the test? And kind of, there's more that you understand than you think, even though it seems a little overwhelming. Okay, we did, we had three good things so far. Any other requests from the practice? Right. I'm not seeing any. So let me talk a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about the about the exam and kind of what to expect. Oh, 
for six, would we carry out the test even though it is not normally distributed? Let's see. So six ACT scores at first glance, are the conditions met? So six, well, there was no statement there. Let's see, let's see six. Let's take a look there, ACT. It's one of our data sets, right? Uh, ACT scores. Let's see how bad it is. Is it really bad? Does it look like really, really not normal? I don't know. It's been a while. So I'm gonna do the same thing if you can, I did that kind of quickly here. I did ACT math. I'm grouping by district. I'm doing relative frequency on the histograms here. I'm overlaying the normal distribution. And then I'm checking to use the same X and Y axis. Ooh, oh yeah. That's not good, that's worse. Oh, these look way more right skewed. That looks worse than the height one to me. That does not look good. Plus, I didn't give it away by saying, hey, go ahead and, and go. <laughs> even if it says it. So what do we want to do? I'm going to try the QQ plots. Um, same thing. This one doesn't look bad. Deviates, they all deviate on the left. Because the problem is they're all skewed right again. So you have these, this spike around you know, 16 or 17, and there's not, it goes all the way up to, it go all the way up to like 30 something, um, but it doesn't go down to zero, right? The spike, the peak here is at, we'll say 16. If the maximum is at 34, say 16 to 34 is 18, well, it can't go down to negative two. So I think these are skewed more, even more so than those heights were. Or yeah, weights, weights, excuse me, weights. Like the weights are skewed, but they more just have a tail. They just have a little tail over here. Otherwise they're relatively symmetric and not even that much of a tail. It's like just these last ones, if they weren't there, then it would be pretty symmetric. Same thing over here. Just these last ones weren't here, pretty symmetric. Um, whereas with the ACT ones, if I take those last couple out, it's still really skewed right. Even, you know, take these last ones out, it's still super skewed right. This one looks kind of like, not. Even, there's no bell. There's no bell shape at all. This one is the closest if you take out those, whatever this district two is, still looks right skewed. So it's not looking good, Brittany. It is not looking good for this test. So I wrote the quiz like, a, I think it was just last fall's when I wrote the quiz. So I don't remember, but my guess is this one's gonna be like check conditions are not met. That's my guess on this one. So you should do that. If I'm wrong, I'll go and fix everybody's score. But <laughs> I don't think the conditions are met for number six. It's interesting. Did you check the variances, Brittany? So it doesn't look like, yeah, the p-value is not that low. So the variances are okay. Variances are okay. Yep. Interesting. Yeah, these are hard. We start to like, I feel like we're, we kind of lose our consistency here. So these are good questions. Definitely good questions. Okay, let me talk a little bit about uh, our last exam. We're gonna do more review on Monday also. Um, 
So let's talk about what will be on the exam. And I have a special review, should be here, this extra review. And one of the biggest challenges for this unit four exam is it's all, pretty much all hypothesis tests. Now there were a couple of confidence intervals, if you remember um, comparing two proportions, comparing two means um, and a mean difference. So there were three confidence intervals. Um, but it's mostly hypothesis testing. And one of the biggest challenges is, how do I know which hypothesis test to do? So what I would do here is, I would really spend some time um, trying to do this extra review. And I was gonna try to set up polling, but my, um, my Zoom got downgraded, so I don't have polling anymore. So maybe, I'll, maybe, maybe I could do, maybe I'll put a note for myself to make a Google form for Monday's practice. And, oh no, the answers are up. That kind of takes the fun out of it. I don't know. Um, but this would be good for you to just know on the test, okay, what are the null and alternative hypotheses? In other words, which hypothesis test is it? And that's all the purpose of this extra review is. There are just a bunch of different like, settings here and you're trying to, you're not trying to do the whole thing. You're just trying to know which hypothesis test is it. Uh, and I actually do have the answers posted, but that's one thing that I highly recommend. It's not just about knowing, okay, when it's ANOVA, here are the requirements, here's how to do the test. That's important, but you can write those things on your formula sheet. What's harder is when do I know when to use an ANOVA? When do I know it's a test for independence? When do I know it's comparing two proportions versus doing a single proportion compared to a population? Those are your biggest challenges. And sometimes if you get off on the wrong test, you, you just becomes impossible and you kind of lose almost all the points on that question because none of your work makes sense. So this is where I really encourage you to practice this. Students that really have a good understanding of which test it is, will often, I've seen perfect scores on this test, which seems like, how do they do that? Because it's, it's, there's so much information. But once you kind of get in the rhythm of, oh, it's, it's a Z test, it's a, it's a proportion test, and you, know, you kind of know all these tests, once, once you know those, the only challenge is really knowing which test to do. And so students who really have a good handle of, oh, these are, these are percentages, these are proportions. So this is clearly comparing two proportions. So it's a proportions test two sample. Um, students who know how to do that can really be, you know, in this, this test can actually not be that bad. So I really would encourage you to work on this, um, work on this extra practice. Um, like usual, there's a practice test, which is an old test that I've given. So you have this unit four practice exam that's in here. You can kind of see what the questions will look like. Uh, you'll notice here I have all the steps laid out. I want you to do the, the null and alternative hypothesis, the test statistic. Tell me what stat, stat crunch command you use. So if you get it wrong, I know what you did. Um, the p-value and the conclusion. So you're kind of doing all those steps. And you'll see that for every single one here. They're all it's the same null hypothesis, alternative hypothesis, test statistic, p-value, conclusion. Um, there are some theoretical questions here. This one is an example about a false positive. I was thinking about doing a question like that um, about the test for the coronavirus antibodies, because if you've been watching the news at all, they've talked about some and their false positive rate. And what does that mean? Uh, which really directly relates to us. It, is that a type one error or a type two error? What is the test? What is the hypothesis test? So, so I, might, I might have a question about that. Um, and then I think there should be, yeah, there's a couple of like, not tests, but like conceptual questions at the end here. Um, and I think I did a couple like this on the final as well, where they're not actually doing a test. You're just kind of trying to know, what is this test about? What is this? What is this test about? What is it? And how does that relate to this box plot? So a lot of things to be working on. Uh, the test is if, uh, reminder is going to be posted after class. Uh, no, what did we say? I keep forgetting. That's why I have to keep checking. I know it's due Wednesday at two, kind of like the end of your semester, the end of your class on Wednesday. 
Uh, I think it's posted Tuesday morning. Does that sound right? Uh, yeah, Tuesday morning. Yep, Tuesday morning. So um, a week from yesterday, Tuesday morning at eight, that last exam will be posted and it'll be due Wednesday at two. By then, I will have all of your homework scores upgraded, upgraded, <laughs> updated, and you should know your quiz grade. So you'll know exactly where you stand going into that fourth exam. Okay, I think that's it for today. Any questions before we before we hang up the call, I guess? Okay, I think that's it. Um, I'm gonna actually, I can hang out for a little while longer, but I'll end class here. I'm gonna stop the recording and feel free to take off.